So to start with, we'll keep talking about um, linear dependence and independence. That was a definition we gave yesterday, and let's remind ourselves. A set of vectors V1, V2, up to Vn is linear V. Independent if the linear equality C one V one plus C two V two plus plus C N Vn equals zero has only the trivial solution. And I um Yesterday, or well, rather Tuesday, I defined linear dependence. And then I said, well, a set is independent if it's not dependent. Here I'm defining independence directly. So let's look at an example. Are the vectors one, seven, and two, four independent or dependent? Every set of vectors, by definition, is either independent or dependent. Well, to solve an example like this, we can just, we're looking at the vector equation, a constant plus the first vector plus a constant times the second vector equals the zero vector. And we are asking ourselves if this vector equation has non-trivial solutions. Remember, if it only has trivial solutions, it's independent. If it has non-trivial solutions, it's dependent. And a vector equation, because every vector equation is equivalent to a system of linear equations, vector equations are solved just like systems of linear equations using Gauss-Jordan elimination. And When we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination, I'm just going to tell you this, fascinating as it may be to watch me type things into the calculator. When we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination, we end up with that. So this first row is C1 equals zero. That second equation is C2 equals zero. So if C1 and C2 are both zero, that's the trivial solution 
So this only has the trivial solution and these vectors are linearly independent. Let's state a quick theorem. This is, this borders on a detour, but we know that systems are of linear equations are the same as vector equations, are the same as matrix equations. So we looked at homogeneous systems, and then the definition of a homogeneous system gave us the idea of linear dependence. I mean, this equation here is a homogeneous vector equation. So linear dependence is just asking whether a homogeneous equation has non-trivial solutions. We haven't discussed this at all in terms of matrix equations, and there's not a lot to say, but what there is to say, we will say. The homogeneous matrix. equation AX equals zero as non trivial solutions. If and only if the columns of A are linearly dependent. And if you like, if you're following along in our textbook, our textbook calls this a theorem, which is maybe granting it a level of importance or a level of significance that it doesn't quite warrant. I wouldn't really call this a theorem. I would call this the definition of linear dependence. Because let's look at this. Let's say A is 1, 7, 2, 4. And we are looking at this matrix equation. But remember that a matrix times a vector is a linear combination of the, of the columns of the vector. This matrix equation is x1 times 1, 2 plus x2 times 7, 4 equals 0, 0. And then, as I say, 
this equation having non-trivial solutions if and only if the vectors are dependent is literally just the definition of dependence. So this isn't really telling us anything exciting or anything we couldn't sort of figure out on our own. But it is a nice little reminder, sort of we defined matrix vector multiplication this way. We haven't done a lot with it yet. So it does provide a nice little reminder of what multiplying a matrix by a vector is actually doing. Let's state some theory. Um, this class has a lot of theorems in it. I normally do not provide a lot of rigorous proofs, but we'll take these theorems as an excuse to try to sort of review the definition of linear independence. So we'll give some proofs just kind of pedagogically because it lets us review these definitions. So theorem one, any set of vectors containing the zero vector is linearly dependent. Proof. Let's say we have a set of vectors containing the zero vector. We'll call the vectors whatever, V sub one up to V sub n. And then we have the zero vector as well. Well, for this set of vectors to be linearly dependent, we need a non-trivial combination, C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus up to Cn, Vn, plus some constant times the zero vector equals the zero vector. If we can find a non-trivial combination like this, we have dependence. And the key here is that to be non-trivial, at least one, of these coefficients has to be non-zero, but, but we only need one to be non-zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to make all of these coefficients be zero, except for the coefficient in front of the zero vector which will that be one, let's say. So here is a non-trivial combination. This one makes it non-trivial and this certainly is equal to the zero vector. So that is, um, that is a proof of this theorem. And that's, this theorem is, you know, 
shows up. This is a theorem that you should know. With a, the next theorem is pretty trivial, but we'll state it anyway. A set containing only one vector is dependent if and only if that vector is the zero vector. And I'll prove this formally. It's just a one line proof. But going back to the intuition I suggested we should have on Tuesday, I said that if a vector represents information, then a dependent set of vectors has redundant information. And we can eliminate vectors without losing anything. Well, with that idea in mind, we can see it should be very hard for a single vector to be dependent. I mean, to have redundant information, you need at least two pieces of information. So this theorem makes sense intuitively. As far as a formal proof, well, this is an if and only if statement. One direction we already did. If this vector is zero, this set is dependent according to the theorem on this frame. Going the other way, suppose Suppose this vector is dependent. Then we can find a non-trivial linear combination that's equal to zero. But because there is only, I mean, going way far back. Here's what a linear combination looks like. If you only have one vector, you're only going to have one term in your linear combination. So a non-trivial linear combination that's equal to zero looks like this. And being non-trivial means that that coefficient C is not zero. And if this coefficient Z is not to zero, we can scale or multiply both sides by one divided by C. The zero vector times any scalar is still the zero vector. So V equals zero as required by this zero. Let's state a maybe more interesting theorem. A two-vector set is linearly dependent if and only if one of the vectors in the set is a scalar multiple 
of the other vector. This is a nice theorem. I mean, granted that two vector sets don't show up that often in application. Uh, going back a few frames, when I did this example, and I just, I didn't go to my calculator, I just said, well, let's save time. Um, we'll just write down what happens when we perform gauss jordan elimination. I was using this theorem when I did this. I looked at these vectors and I said, well, they're not constant multiples of each other, so they are linearly independent. So C1 will have to be zero and C2 will have to be zero. So this is what we'll get when we perform the elimination. Um, proof. Let's see. Let's suppose this is a pretty basic proof, but again, I like these because they help us review the definitions. Let's suppose the set V comma W is dependent. then we can find a non-trivial combination C of V plus D W equals the zero vector. And non-trivial means at least one of those scalars is not to zero. So maybe C is zero or maybe D is zero, but they can't both be zero. And have all of you taken some kind of proofs not by way of contradiction, just writing stuff at random here. What I'm trying to write is without loss of generality. And what I mean by that is that I'm going to select one of these constants and say it's not zero. Let's say C isn't zero. And what I mean by without loss of generality is that the proof would go through exactly the same way if I said that D wasn't to zero. The key point here is that one of these isn't zero. It doesn't matter which one specifically. If C is not zero, we can solve this equation. V is negative D divided by C times W. Just subtract the DW over to the right and multiply by one over C. And this, of course, is a scalar. So one of these vectors, V, is a scalar multiple of the other vector, W. I'm going to, just so that I have the theorem here, I'm going to erase this proof and then do the other direction in the blank space. 
Does anybody have any questions about this before it goes away? Feels like there must be a quicker way of erasing stuff, but we're done now. So the other direction is very straightforward. Again, without loss of generality, I'm saying that one of the vectors is a scaled or multiple of the other. Let's say it's a V that's a scalar multiple of W. Then one times V plus negative alpha times W equals the zero vector. Or just taking everything and moving it to the left-hand side of the equality. And this is non-trivial. And it's definitely non-trivial because of that one. Um, Remember that to be non-trivial, we only need one of the coefficients to not be zero. We don't know about alpha, but clearly one is not to zero. So this is non-trivial. And that makes these vectors dependent. Well, as I say, it's a nice theorem, but outside of pretty some pretty limited applications, I wouldn't assume that you'll be working a lot with two vector sets, like if you go into industry or whatever. Let's generalize this a little theorem. A set of vectors is dependent if at least one. vector in the set is a constant, is not a constant, sorry, is a linear combination of the other vectors. I'm not, the proof of this is extremely similar to the proof of this. I'm maybe not going to give it again because it is so similar. Let's uh, take note of what this isn't saying. This is not saying that every vector in the set is a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. It's saying that at least one vector in the set is a linear combination of the other. So, for example, we could look 
at the set one, two, the set, um, what am I trying? What's a good example? Let's look at the set. And by good, I mean simple. So let's look at one is zero, two is zero, zero, one. This set of vectors is dependent. And I'm not going to give an argument for this because the very next theorem we give will make it easy to see this. For now, let's just accept that this set of vectors is dependent. The vector two zero is a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. It's two times one is zero plus zero times zero one. And I know I said I wasn't going to prove this, but let's go back to this theorem. That's actually an if and only if statement. So once I made the observation that one vector was a linear combination of the other two, that is a proof that they are dependent. On the other hand, the vector zero one is clearly not a linear combination of the other vectors. Well, maybe I should be cautious if with words like clearly. Can somebody say why zero one can't be a linear combination of the other vectors? Think this through a little. This linear combination is alpha plus two beta zero. Zero is not one. Right. So no matter what alpha and beta you select, this zero can never equal that one. So these can't possibly be the same. So a vector in the set was a linear combination of the other vectors in the set, but not every vector in the set has that property. Zero, one didn't. And now here's a super important theorem, a theorem that everyone should know. Any set of more than N vectors in R N is linear the dependent. So when I wrote this example on the board, I knew instantly that that set of vectors was dependent because we're in R2, but there are three vectors and three is greater than two. 
The proof of this is something we should see, or at least we should see an argument. Writing down a formal proof is maybe a little tedious, but if we just see why this theorem is true for a specific set of vectors, let's say one seven, two four, one one, then the logic behind this theorem will be made clear. So, to be dependent, to be dependent, we need non trivial solutions to C1 times the first vector plus C2 times the second vector plus C3 times the third vector equals the zero vector. And having non-trivial solutions is the same as having infinite solutions. Remember that this is homogeneous we have two options, one solution or infinite solutions. So to be dependent, this vector equation needs to have infinitely many solutions. To solve this vector equation, we would perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on the augmented matrix that has these vectors as its columns. And I am not going to perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. Instead, I'm going to just reason this through. What do we need? Or what would cause us to have infinite solutions? We would have infinite solutions if we had at least one free variable. And without doing any work, I'm going to say we do have at least one free variable. There are infinitely many solutions. And these vectors are linearly dependent. Well, how does that work? Remember that variables are either basic or free depending on whether the column they correspond to is a pivot column. And a pivot position is the first entry of a row. I mean, it's the first entry of a row after a matrix has been put into row echelon form, but it's the first entry of a row meaning 
that we cannot have more pivot positions than we have rows. So this matrix here can have at most two basic variables. It can have at most one basic variable per row. If a variable is not basic, it's free. We have three variables, x, y, and z, or whatever we're calling them. We have at most two basic variables. So at least one of our variables has to be free. And if one of our variables is free, There are infinitely many solutions. And this set of vectors is dependent. And I mean, there's nothing special about, um, about the particular vectors I selected here. The point of this proof is that we're always going to have at most n basic variables. And if we have more than n vectors, that gives us more than n variables. And at least one of those variables must therefore be free. And that's it for this section. There's homework on this section. As I say, the next section, the whole I've um the next two sections are both on linear transformations. There's a combined homework assignment, so you won't get that until next week. 